Good evening, tubers. Matt M. Roy back once again. Back to you with another live stream. How's everybody doing tonight? I had a great time earlier, to be honest with you. Mom and I went over to uh, Hampton Town Center and did a little bit of a walk around there, and it was fantastic. Beautiful day. Perfect day for it, actually. Trying to keep our social distancing, because that is still a thing. We want to uh, observe everybody's health out there. Uh, but that's not what this live stream is going to be about. This live stream is going to be tech-related. Uh, now, if you saw the thumbnail, you probably are thinking to yourself, hmm, scratch out, Matt, why would you say that this would stop my computer from running? Well, I had to be a little clickbaity, and it's only partially clickbaity, and here is why. I pulled out a old computer that I have, and it's actually sitting right there. If you could see it in the corner there, right there. It is a Pentium 3 era, uh, 800 megahertz system. Uh, motherboard, I'm not exactly sure what a motherboard is, but it's got a Phoenix BIOS in it, uh, right? A Phoenix BIOS, when was the last time you heard that name? Um, and I hadn't used it for a while, but I was looking to play Star Wars Episode One Racer, which that is the perfect computer to play it on. As a matter of fact, I still have my game saved on there. So what happened was I plugged it up, went to turn it on, booted into Windows just fine, and froze. I mean, just froze. And I'm like, oh boy, what in the world is going on here? So I turned it off, um, opened the case up, checked all the connections. Everything looked good. Rebooted again. Um, Windows booted up. This time I went a little bit further. I was actually able to uh, load the window, the Star Wars racer game um, partially. I got about halfway through and then once again, froze. So I'm like, all right, something weird is going on here. I remember when I put this computer away about a year ago that it was running just fine. Then I took a look at the drives. More specifically, this one right here. This is a Hewlett Packard. Um, what is this? This is a 8250i CD burner. As a matter of fact, this is the first burner I ever owned um when i was a kid uh my parents bought it for me i think around the year 2000 the only difference being mine had the uh, blue face and this has the gray face i think that's just because this came pre-built with the system um what i noticed was i had the red light because these back then had a green light for reading and a red light for writing kind of a nifty feature at the time it allowed you to know whether or not you were reading or writing to a disc. Well, I noticed that the red light was constantly on, and that's not normal. Unless you're burning a CD, that red light should not be on. So I started brainstorming. I'm like, wait a minute. I vaguely remember that when my drive started to fail, it did the same thing. It would actually prevent the computer from booting most of the time, and even when the computer did, uh, the computer itself would uh, freeze up shortly after. So I said to myself, you know what, let's go ahead. And I went and unplugged the uh, IDE cable. I even, didn't even bother unplugging the power cable, just unplugged the IDE cable from the computer. And guess what, folks? Works perfectly fine now. As a matter of fact, I was just playing some uh, Star Wars Episode One Racer uh, right before I started this live stream. Now, here's the reasoning behind this, and it gets a little complicated. IDE um, daisy chains the drives together. So basically with ID, you have two different channels and you can have up to two drives connected to one cable. In my case, I had this drive connected and then uh, as the slave drive, and then I had a newer uh, light on DVD burner set as the master. Well, what was happening is this was uh, the, the, the controller board inside of you were starting to fail and was throwing garbage information over that IDE cable. And that was preventing the computer from booting properly because it does a, a check on that IDE chain, basically similar like what a SCSI uh, cable would do. And when it went to check on the this drive, the drive was giving it false data and the computer realized there was a problem and it was causing Windows to freeze up. So 
long story short, without getting too technical, if you have an older computer and you're running an IDE drive on there, uh, it doesn't matter if it's an optical drive, uh, like a DVD burner, CD burner, or a hard drive, and your computer boots but freezes, check and make sure you don't have a drive failing because if a drive fails, then it can cause all different kinds of problems in the computer. And that's why SATA is definitely the superior interface because unlike IDE, SATA interfaces are single. In other words, they're single channel. So you have one drive, one channel, one drive, one channel, whereas with IDE, you're chaining two drives together and that can cause all kinds of problems. And I can see that Eric's Roddy channel says the same thing. He's seen many of those HP drives that did that. I think it was a uh, failure in failure point for these in the boards. Now, to be fair, this drive, well, let's see. This drive is manufactured September of 1999. So this drive is 21 years old. So I really can't fault HP. If it lasted 21 years, I got my money's worth, but I just wanted to put that little piece of information out there because um, it has is something that I've run into in the past, more specifically with these exact drives. And for those of you that are interested, this is a 4x4x24 four by four by drive. So read at 4 speed, rewrote at 4 speed, and read at 24 speed, which for the time was pretty darn good. We're talking about a time in when a two-speed burner was very expensive. So I can imagine if this did come new in a computer back then, it probably boosted the price of that computer three or $400. Because if you were to buy this outright, which I did basically back in like the year 2000, because they were still selling these, they were like $300, $350. So was not a cheap option back then. And the cool thing was back then, well, I guess not really cool, but what, what, what happened back then, most people couldn't afford to go um, burner and DVD. It was very rare you would find a computer that had a DVD-ROM drive and a CD burner. You would usually choose one over the other because to have both, you were talking about adding maybe another five or $600 to the price of that computer. Mark Covington's here, uh, Mike Perrin is here, and who else? Stephen Barber. My old HP had a gray drive, but mine was a CD drive. Missed that old HP Windows ME system. Ugh, no Windows ME. That's a, that's a dirty word on this channel. Jacob N Nimi, hi. Charles Lipinski. Oh, I didn't see Charlie. Okay, yeah, there's Charlie. It's like Jay Kess put up another video. Actually, if you look back there, I was watching auto auction rebuilds. Um, basically, before I did this live stream, like I was almost late to it. And uh, I was like, oh, boy, because I was really interested. He's looking at a uh, Buick Century. So who's that? Uh, Stephen Barber. He might be buying one of those, so if you want, check out his channel. He's got some really interesting content. He buys and sells vehicles from auctions, uh, usually uh, insurance auctions or Copart. If you guys have ever heard of Copart before? Mark Covington asks, what would, be, what would you say is the biggest thing to stop your PC from running? Uh, user error. Definitely user error. Very rarely is it a actual hardware problem. Usually it's a problem with the person using the PC. Generally, they've downloaded some um, questionable material and it's put a virus in the computer or some type of infection. Eric goes, I got financing on a gateway system back in the day. I ordered it with a DVD and a CD burner. The system was stupid expensive, and I had an old crappy monitor with it. Yeah, that is when Gateway used to have stores all over the place. I remember there was one in Virginia Beach. And they it was really interesting because you would go in there. You, the salesman would spend – they would spend up to an hour or two with you trying to pick out the perfect system. And the cool part back then was if they didn't have the exact computer there that you wanted, they could build it because the the actual um, 
facility, the actual, um, my mind just went blank here, production facility was actually just over in Hampton, and that was maybe 20 minutes away. So they would actually build it for you, and they would either send it to the store or they would ship it right to your house. It's a shame that Gateway had to go under like that, but they just couldn't um, – keep a profit going you know what really killed gateway was for many years they 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 were using used and or refurbished parts which were just really used parts in their new pc builds and it didn't come out for a while they've been doing this for four or five years i think before they actually got caught um, but once they got caught the damage was done and that was all she wrote. They never could get their reputation back again. Uh, Acer acquired uh, Gateway after a while. And yeah, in 2006, around there, they kept the name going uh, until about 2009, uh, where they just retired it totally. So a little lesson for you there, folks. If you are in business like, like I am, and you are selling computers as new, but they really have used parts in them, don't do it. It's going to come back to bite you in the butt. Had a 533 megahertz Celeron instead of the 1 gigahertz Pentium 3. Well, that was a big savings back then. I mean, if it was 1999, that was probably the difference between a $1,500 system and a $3,000 system. And for most people back then, that was more than enough speed. I mean, unless you were doing like AutoCAD or maybe photo editing back then you really didn't need all that power because, because again most of the programs back then were written for the slower clock speed so there really wasn't a lot of software at that point that could take advantage of the one gigahertz Pentium 3s. Mark Covington asks, my old computer won't accept any more updates. What do you think might be the cause of the problem? Do you have any solutions for that? Uh, well, you want to make sure you have automatic updates turned on, but if it's not accepting updates, uh, you may just have run out of hard drive space when you're or running low. When you start to run low on hard drive space, uh, Windows will prevent updates from installing because if it didn't, then you'd be in big trouble because your hard drive would basically go down to zero. And at that point, you'd be being pretty much out of luck. If you if you actually fill your hard drive completely up, uh, Windows won't even boot because it actually relies on some of the space on your hard drive as cache memory, basically as, um, I can't think of what it's called off the top of my head, but it's like um, virtual memory. In other words, it uses some of that for extra storage for things that Windows is doing while the computer is booted. That was my moment of silence for Gateway. That's right. If it's not brand new, then it's it's not brand new. It's newer or refurbished. Refurbished is a great word because refurbished doesn't necessarily mean it's new. It just means that it's been gone through and usually as a guarantee and people can at least rely on it. But if you put something that's used out and you say it's new, that's a downright lie. That's an outright lie and i'm sorry you're 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 a scumbag at that point and just just saying just saying no somebody's missing their kitty Aww. it's not anywhere near where i live i'm just perusing the next door app just in case anybody might need help during this time of crisis. All right, folks, I'm ending it here. That was just going to be a quick live stream for you. Hope you guys are having a great day. Stay safe. Please stay inside if you don't have to venture out. And as always, have a blessed day, everybody.